I uh, was telling a friend of mine last night that I had a dream. And in this dream, there was uh, a lot of old gentlemen, old, old Ho-Chunks. And they were all speaking. And it became this one old gentleman's time to tell a story. You know, I learned this story from my grandfather, and the way that my grandfather tells the story is the way that I, I tell it. But this guy was old, older, much older. And he started us telling the story, and I, I, I could follow it. But he used words that I, I haven't heard. I've never heard. I inferred the meaning from the way he used it in the story. And I went and talked to my brother about it my brothers, and we sat there and we talked about those words. It didn't ring a bell with any of us, you know, so I went back to the story and I told the story and then I used that, that word. You know, and I go back and I'd say, okay, and this is where he used this word and I'd use that word again and we said that now, your inference is probably correct, what you think that it means. I think that's what it means too, but I don't know what it means, I've never, you know, <laughs> it was um, um, a good dream. Ho Chunk History was funded in part by. Irene Danielle Kress, Francis A. and Georgia F. Ahrens Fund of the Community Foundation for the Fox Valley Region, Evu Foundation, Ron and Patty Anderson, Ira and Aniva Riley Baldwin, Wisconsin Idea Endowment, National Endowment for the Humanities, and Friends of Wisconsin Public Television. Ege hi chakaro ni na ni karagit. Hira peras shanak shan e mahi hi gaire da. Ega ho chungi jo wa onak shan. Hi choke hara wak ine kige hi gaire. Ega hi anshara mashta mani hi gaire. E ho chungo wa ine. Ega wa rin wa rin peras chi wa rin hi gaire shono. You know me well. My name is Andy Thundercloud. I'm a member of the Ho-Chunk tribe. My grandfather told me that we were always great people. He said that we were always respected by the tribes that surrounded us. And he said some of that respect even ran to fear, you know, because we were supposedly a very fierce, proud people, you know, that protected what we considered to be ours. The land that we considered to be home ran from, I guess, North Michigan, the Northern Peninsula, as far as Chicago, you know, because Chicago has a whole chunk name, and then from there it ran to the west, uh, the Mississippi, and then from there we back up north again. What, what we considered to be our land, you know, that, uh, that we were given the responsibility of, uh, uh, what should I say, maintaining it? You know, as, as, as it should be, and that was, uh, you know, created for us, the, the creatures that we, that we saw here, that we had here, when they were created for us, you know, as well as, you know, these trees, this grass, the water, everything was created for us, and they're all considered to be sacred by us, and we do our best to maintain that, uh, the relationship that we have with them. When we are going to use a tree for whatever purpose, we offer tobacco and a prayer, you know, that we're going to, you know, be taking this tree and we're going to be using it, you know, for a certain purpose. Same is uh, true if uh, we were going out to gather, gather medicine. You know, I was sitting here looking around earlier and I was kind of going, hmm, you know, I wonder what kind of medicine is around here. You know, and the, my grandfather used to take me out to gather medicines. And he would tell me, well, this medicine is used for this, and this medicine is used for that, and you can use it for this, and do it for that. And, and that he said that each time that we harvested some of that, you know, that we offered tobacco 
that we were going to be using this for a purpose, you know, to make our people stronger, make our people well. But from what I gather from my history, uh, grandfather said that we were traveling people. We've traveled throughout the continental United States. There have been stories of, uh, well, I guess these are recent stories that, uh, um, recent is, you know, <laughs> you take a look at it, consider colonial times, you know, back in the 1700s as being, as being recent. There were stories of uh, groups of our individuals that would, uh, that would travel east. It took them a long time to get to their destination. And the destination didn't have a Ho-Chunk name so it was referred to as Boston. They went there to trade. You know, they took their objects that they were gonna trade and they traded for knives and, you know, metal objects. And once they traded, then they started their journey back. And from what I understand, that journey would often take two years, a year to get there and a year to get back. But I think the thing I distinctly remember, uh, my grandfather telling me is that, you know, to the west of us is the Great River the Mississippi, and uh, at one time there was a, a large number of us that uh, I went down the Mississippi and uh, came to where the Missouri River and the Mississippi River come together. I guess that would be the area of St. Louis, and uh, we settled there. For whatever reason, you know, there were some younger members of the tribe that became disgruntled, and they moved off to the west and a little bit south of there. There were others that became disgruntled and uh, went up the Missouri River, settled in there, and some of them even went further up the Missouri River and, and settled up in the Dakota area. I've been told that many of the tribes that currently exist in Iowa, Nebraska, South Dakota, North Dakota, even Oklahoma, and are all originally Ho-Chunks. In fact, he told me a story Sometimes during the 1800s, there was a large gathering of Indians in Omaha. I think there was the Punkas, the Otos, the Missouris, the Iowa, the Omahas, and uh, some Sioux. There was a gentleman that came from the east, and this anthropologist asked these other tribes, uh, where you reside now, have you always resided there, or did you come from somewhere else? And each of them says, no, we came from Mokashuch. Mokashuch translates to Red Bank, the Green Bay area. I guess I could say our Garden of Eden, you know, because that's where we were created. So the Winnebago uh, Ho-Chunk people, we were known as Winnebago at one time. I don't remember what tribe gave us that name, you know, but it was anglicized to Winnebago. To us, we've always been Ho-Chunk Winnebago. It's a foreign name to me. I grew up with my grandfather. My grandfather raised me, raised me until I went to school. And during that time, I never spoke English. In fact, I distinctly remember the first time I saw a white person. I must have been four years old. And uh, this uh, white person came to the house asking for my grandfather. And I was I remember being a little bit astounded because he was uh, he was a little white guy, he had just a little fringe of hair around here, and but he spoke Ho Chunk, you know, and, and that and that confused me. So after he left, I asked Grandpa. I said, Grandpa, who is that man? Uh, what family does he come from? What clan does he belong to? And Grandpa just just laughed, you know, he just laughed, and he thought it was funny, and he told me that uh, they belong to a a race that we call uh, big knives. And that there were a lot of them in the world. And the world, as we knew it, was pretty much governed by what they did. And he said that I'd have to get used to it. He said, because you're going to run into them in your lifetime. A couple of years later, when I started school, I found out what he was talking about. <laughs> I started school, I wasn't able to speak any, any English at all. And I, you know, I think that I did well because I never was held up in any grades. Uh, graduated eighth grade on time, graduated high school on time. Uh, I wish I could say the same thing about college, but I can't say that, but I, you know. 
I did finally finish. And uh, I'm a member of the Thunder Clan. And that's where our chiefs come from. And my grandfather always told me to, to conduct myself, you know, as such. Um, he told me that uh, we were the chiefs, he said, but never to say that, never to come right out and use that as a way of being authoritative. He said that uh, I don't do that because the way of the chief is hard. He said it's a very difficult life. And he said that I'm not capable of doing that. So therefore, you know, I don't call myself chief. We are divided into 12 clans. Uh, there are eight clans that belong here on Earth, and there's four clans that belong up above. And in the past, each clan had a certain responsibility within the tribe to ensure that everything went well. They each had a certain area, you know, that they lived in. They took their responsibilities to heart, and they did them well. You can take a look at it as each being different departments, maybe the Department of Transportation, the Department of Commerce, Department of Agriculture, and, uh, those, those kind of things, but that's the way the, the tribe was. Our modern government is more structured after, you know, what everyone does. We've got a president, we've got a legislature, so we've got the executive branch, we've got the judicial branch, we've got the legislative branch. You know, elections every four years and to elect our legislators and elect our president. The president appoints heads of the various departments that we have within the tribe. Clans were created eons, thousands of years ago through our origin stories. Those clans still exist today, but since we are not a central cohesive unit um, until we come together for ceremonies, then those clan responsibilities kick in. You know, like I said, we of the Thunder Clan were the chiefs. It was our responsibility to see to the well-being of our people. If somebody came to us and said, I don't have a home, we'd immediately abandon what we were living in and said, here's your new home. Or if somebody come to us and said, uh, we haven't been able to procure any food. And that's all we had to do is then we'd give them, give them food and sustenance and, and whatever. And I think that's what grandfather was talking about when he said it was difficult. You know, it's like in modern day times, you would come up to me and said, Andy, you know, I don't have a car. You know, and if I was a true chief, I'd reach in my pocket and say, here, here's your car. I'm a Thunder Clan because my father was a Thunder Clan. You know, we follow our father's lineage, although our mother's lineage plays a lot into it, too. <laughs> you know, I've tried to explain our relationships, and I said, it's simple, you know. My father, all my father's brothers are my father's. Hence, all their children are my brothers and sisters. Okay, all my mother's sisters are my mother's. Hence, all their children are my brothers and sisters. Now, my mother's brothers are my uncles, and my father's sisters are my aunts. I have a nephew now that's, uh, this is funny, okay. His father is my uncle, but his mother is my sister. Okay, so on his mother's side, I'm, I'm his uncle. You know, but on his father's side, he's my uncle, you know, so we're nephews to one another. And that's, you know, that's the way we address one another. <laughs> it's a unique, you know, a unique uh, relationship. My grandfather always said that, you know, I should be proud of who I am and where I've come from. And he often told me stories about the Ho-Chunk people. He's told me stories about how large our tribe was at one time, you know, without even giving me any numbers. But I'm, I'm assuming that we ran into the tens of thousands. I, I don't know. He told me that uh, we were created here. You know, I don't care, you know, what anthropologists have said. I firmly believe that, you know, this is where we were created and this is where we live. This is where we have lived. This is where we will continue to live uh, as time goes on. 
grandfather told me many stories. He said the coming of the white man changed a lot because he often told me that these white people think that they know something. He said, but they don't. But because of the, you know, the technology they had or the knowledge that, uh, that they had, um, we were forced to live, live in their style. Our relocation program that they had for us, we were moved to the West, forcibly removed to the West. And uh, stories about when the troops, the federal troops got back, the Ho-Chunks would be here waiting. There was a story about an old man who was well over 100 years old. His name was Yellow Thunder, and he was removed. And uh, uh, by the time the troops came back, he was sitting there waiting for them. You know, and whatever, and, that, and, the, and those those stories go on. You know, I don't know how many times I think believe we were moved to Minnesota, northern Minnesota, then southern Minnesota, and then from there we were moved to Crow Creek area in South Dakota. They didn't like it. It wasn't our home, and they grew very disgruntled. And some of them went down the Missouri River and settled among the Omaha's. And sometimes in the past we acquired half of their reservation, so therefore we have a reservation in Nebraska. Here in the state of Wisconsin, we don't have a reservation. We do have land that belongs to the Ho-Chunk, and I don't know what that amount of land is. You know, there are certain members, you know, that are just bound and determined that, you know, that we need to get that land and whatever. And they've asked me what I thought. I'm a member of the Elder Council, you know, which is made up of elders from each of the clans, like we were set up at one time and people come to us for advice. And I told them, all of this is sacred. That's what I've learned. I have no say so about what happens here on the ground. That's Bear Clan responsibility. My responsibility is higher than that. You know, they always call me one of those uppity Thunder Clan people. You know, and it's jokingly referred to, but I'd like to think that we're apolitical, but we're not. Because <laughs> we, have, we have a lot of authority. You know, just because of being being elder, being an elder. I guess that's just kind of a brief history, you know, from what I've heard. You know, Grandpa could sit for hours and talk to me and tell me stories. And, and uh, believe it or not, I was uh, uh, I could sit and listen to him, you know, because it was you know it it always amazed me. At, uh, you know, I guess we take a look at it and we think about it and. Um, it was just like uh, uh, a book, you know, a book that your your mother, father, or grandmother, or grandmother, grandfather would be reading to you because it was so interesting. You know, it just it just it just had my rapt, you know, as raptly in, intent on on listening to what he what he said. Because I remember even going to bed at night and he'd be talking. You know, and I'd fall asleep, and I'd wake up in the morning, and he'd still, you know, he'd be talking again. You know, and I used to wonder, you know, think to myself, did he talk all night, and I miss something? <laughs> but uh, I think the things that were of import, you know, he told me many times. The same with my father. My father would tell me things, and then someplace down the line again, he'd tell me again. And I never told him, you already told me that. You know, I would just sit and listen to them. And, nod and they'd ask me if I understood and even though I didn't understand I'd say yes. I've told them to my children and my grandchildren exactly what my grandfather told me and exactly what my father told me. I blend history, I talk about our society, and I talk about culture just like I was sitting here talking about the trees and the grass and the earth itself, the water and the relationship that we have with them. Each of what we see here has a story, you know, and that's part of our creation story. But it's many stories, you know, that follow the main line. There's the uh, main stories, but there's many other little additions to it, you know, so that even after all these years, I don't think I know it all yet. <laughs> but uh, there's things that my grandfather has told me, you know, that I don't understand. Even to this day, I don't under, understand. But uh, <clears throat> occasionally, uh, I might see something, I might experience something, I might hear something. And then uh, 
a little bell goes off in my head. Ding! Hmm, that's what Grandpa was talking about. I said, no, and, you know, I have, and I have to think about it, you know, it might, it might puzzle me, you know, that causes me some puzzlement. And doing things like that or hearing things like that and believing things like that, you know, it makes us who we are. You know, people often talk about culture, and you know, I say culture is something very, very difficult to teach. I hope that's what I'm doing with my children, my grandchildren, and even the younger people that come to me seeking advice or seeking a story. I hope that I'm making them you know, understand who we are. I want them to be proud, you know, who they are, and who we are, you know, because I'm, I'm very, very proud that we, that we still exist, you know, that we still have our language, we still have our religions that we, that we uh, practice. You know, we just finished off a week-long uh, ceremony here last week. We finished off, we started Monday and we finished uh, Sunday. And I, I think I'm recovered from that. <laughs> Our ceremonies are, you know, they're religious. Just like any religion that we have is supposed to carry over into everyday things. And that's the way our ceremonies are. You know, the ceremony that we just finished is we initiated a new member into our medicine lodge. And in doing so, we're praying, you know, for a long, fruitful, productive life for him in the path that he's taking, the path that he's going to be on. And uh, I guess we spent the entire week telling him, telling about the, the road that he's going to travel now. And, uh, you know, the ways that he, t to conduct himself and, you know, those, those kind of things. And, and the understanding and the love that he should have for his fellow, fellow humans. We're going to always be here. Whether we're going to be here in Ho-Chunk name only, or whether we're going to be here as Ho-Chunks. Our language is what makes us who we are and what we are. Again, this relates back to a story. My grandfather said that we were given this language by, by Mauna, God, uh, and as such that it's sacred. Our language to us is sacred, you know, that we should treat it that way, you know, and that we should use it that way. And then he said that uh, one of these days, you know, this language is going to be gone. And when the language is gone, that's the end of the world. And I guess when I was younger, I used to think about, you know, the modern things, what they think about in, in, in Christianity, you know, the apocalypse, you know, great fire, you know, great storm, uh, whatever, whatever else. And I thought it was completely the physical end of the world and whatever. But as time go, has gone along, it's one of those occasions, like I said, oh, that's what Grandpa meant, you know. I see, I see us becoming, for lack of a be better word, I see us becoming more and more white as we lose our language, you know. And I, I see that among many of the tribes that I've gone to, you know, as they lose their language, they become more Europeanized, I guess would be, <laughs> anglicized or whatever. And I see that's what he meant. What we knew, what our grandparents knew, what our great grandparents knew, what they followed, you know, it's, go it's going to be gone. Um, that's why language, language is important to me. And it's very, very important to me because I don't wanna, um, I don't wanna see us lose the, the beautiful life, you know, that we have, you know, that I've, I've known. You know, I don't, I don't want to see that. I don't want to see my children lose that. I don't want to see my grandchildren lose that. My great-grandchildren lose that. I believe it's important, and I do my best to uh, maintain our language. In July, I was given the, uh, uh, the responsibility of taking a new apprentice and teaching him our language. And uh, I think he's, he's doing very well. I think that uh, in a matter of time, he's going to be uh, He's going to be an excellent speaker.
To learn more about the sovereign Indian nations in Wisconsin, visit wisconsinact31.org. To purchase a DVD of this and other Tribal Histories programs, visit wpt.org or call 800-422-9707. Ho-Chunk History was funded in part by Irene Danielle Kress, Francis A. and Georgia F. Ahrens Fund of the Community Foundation for the Fox Valley Region, Evu Foundation, Ron and Patty Anderson, Ira and Aniva Riley Baldwin, Wisconsin Idea Endowment, National Endowment for the Humanities, and Friends of Wisconsin Public Television,